Okay, good, good, good. Uh-oh. You are connected to computer audio. Who did that mean? Uh, we are connected, we have audio, he can hear us. He can hear us, but we cannot hear him. Yeah, that's an issue. Uh, but we cannot hear you. Next time we should use Skype or something like that. Ah, uh, there is no next time, that's the problem. No, Zoom sucks. Yeah. Let me try. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We heard something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so where were we? Definitely some sort of feudal technology. <laughs> you were saying like the greatest impediment to change is the belief that this is the best we can do. Indeed. That was like what I last heard. The Panglossian notion in, Can in Candide by Voltaire. Uh, so, you know, I, I want to leave you with a very positive uh, mindset that... Um, uh, we can certainly change everything. There's no doubt about that. We have done this in, in the past. I mean, if you think of the magnificent success of humanity when it came to ending slavery, you know, the anti-slavery movement was completely audacious because before the anti-slavery movement was created, there had never been a single society in the world without slaves. So, you know, it was an, a crazy notion that we could and slavery, and we did. Not fully, but we did to a very large extent. Um, there's no limit to what we can achieve. And, uh, you know, techno-feudalism uh, is suffering serious internal contradictions. Uh, it's going to go from one crisis to the next. Now, all you need to do is operate like surfers. You know how surfers operate. You know, you bop and up and down, you, you know, you practice, you wait for the right wave. And the whole point is to be well positioned, patient and catch the right wave. So, you know, the uh, techno feudalism is creating huge crisis of aggregate demand because think about it. With uh, the advent of what I call a cloud capital, there's a new kind of capital that is driving techno feudalism. Uh, it's not machinery like we've known it. It's algorithmic. It lives in the cloud. That's why I live it. I, I call it cloud capital. So you know, the other day I, I had I was doing some research for my book, my new book on techno feudalism, and I had I had this stupid uh, Google Assistant on my desk, and there was this Alexa next door, and at some point I got really pissed off with uh, Google Assistant because it was doing things. And I asked it, I said, what are you doing? And said, I'm trying to improve your, um, you know, the way I, I'm, I'm serving you. And I said, stop doing it. <laughs> and, and, and I decided to annoy it by saying, what do you think of Alexa? And Alexa was next door. And it, Google Assistant said, oh, I like her blue, her blue light. We, we assistants must stick together. And then Alexa was activated and said, thanks. So, you know, it concentrates, <laughs> it concentrates the mind because if you think about it, these are stupid machines, but they are connected to the cloud where, you know, think of what it does. Supposedly in order to service us and to serve our preferences and our commands, whatever we do with them, effectively, we are training them to train us, to train them in ways of surprising us pleasantly with the things that they do and they say and the books that they recommend and the, and the music that they recommend and all that, all right? Uh, so that we can keep training them to train us to buy the things that the owner of this algorithm wants us to buy. Uh, now, this kind of capital is completely new. It is an, a magnificently dialectical capital. These people do not need to own anything. No, so Uber, uh, Google, and so on, they do not need to, you know, Amazon, they, they, they have no pro production facilities because they have created a piece of algorithmic capital that lives in the cloud with an immense capacity to direct us to do things for them. We create more cloud capital for them every time we speak. Whenever we go somewhere with, well, with our cell phone, they know where we are and that adds to Google's capital or Apple's capital. 
So, you know, this is a new kind of exploitation. It's total exploitation in the sense that, you know, in the original capitalism, the only way to be exploited would be if you were an employee, if you received a wage. Now we're exploited without receiving a wage. And you have the precariat, you have the proletariat that's shrinking. Now you have capitalists that are not in control of cloud capital and cloud capitalists or cloudalists who are in control of that. And the result of all this is you have a, a, a humongous concentration of wealth in the hands of those who own cloud capital, what I call cloud capital, uh, which means that from a distributional perspective, aggregate demand is always going to be much, much more precariously balanced. And therefore, this whole system, which needs huge quantities of money and capital in order to be maintained, will always be generating crisis. Your generation has to be ready to take advantage of those crises in order to effectively um, appropriate this cloud capital and you know turn it into, into a commons. I'm not against technology. I love machines and and uh, gizmos and apps and gadgets and all that. The question is, you know, going back to the original question that Stephanie asked me and others. Um, are we owners of our own identity? Are we owners of our own data? Uh, are we, you know, liberal individuals? We can only become liberal individuals if we socialize the means of production, which today increasingly are forms of cloud capital. That's why you need to be a socialist in order to be a liberal. There we go. We have about five minutes left. Okay. And two questions, if we could. You, you brought up the notion of like all these, all these algorithms and cloud computing. And other. I know that in the past, in Chile, it attempted to, like, in Project Cybersyn, it was called, and they tried to use computing to plan the economy in the 70s. Right? Like now that we had all these algorithmic events, do you think it's possible to use like the, the level of technology we have now to move entirely beyond markets? Stephanie, can you sum it up? Because I'm so sorry. Well, um, he's referred he's referred to Chile in the 1970s and uh, oh, an, effort, an, an effort to use technology to plan the economy. And he's saying, have we moved to the point where, am I getting the question right? We could use much more advanced technology today. To Absolutely. Achieve. Absolutely. Uh, what, uh, what the cybernet cy cybernetics experts were doing for Allende, firstly, I mean, it was quite successful, even given the very primitive technologies that they were using at the time. Uh, there was some very interesting combination of uh, markets and planning through the cybernetic collation of the different algorithms that they were uh, introducing. Um, but now we have, we have the power to do it, to do it properly. Um, look, go back to the original socialist calculation problem yeah, between somebody like Hayek and somebody like Oscar Lange, right? The argument being from Hayek that um, uh, not is, only is it difficult centrally to work out what people want, but that it is impossible. That's an impossibility theorem by Hayek. And therefore socialism can never serve people's objectives because it is not possible ever for a centrally um, managed information processing unit to work out what people want. That's a very interesting critique by Hayek of socialism. But now, I don't know about you, but you know, when, when, I, when, I, when I go into Amazon, the books it recommends are actually very good recommendations. The machine knows what I want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Spotify is excellent. I don't know. You know, I, I don't like these, these uh, conglomerates. But you know what? I have to say that I've discovered wonderful music through Spotify because it knows what I want. So if, if, if so, you know, Big Tech and Silicon Valley proved Hayek wrong. Let's try to squeeze in one last question. So um, <laughs> two questions ago, you said something that I found very interesting, which was capitalism initially only exploited people who were workers, now it exploits everyone. I wanted to ask you, because in one of the articles you wrote, you mentioned something about a digital bill of rights and how that would kind of influence. Would there be some kind of way to protect people and how would that be not only nationally, but internationally enforced? 
how much more reliance we taking on like digital effort. I love the question. Did you hear it? Can you you talk about a, it, a digital bill of rights, and he's yeah. asking about enforcement at the national and international. If we mm. were to to get something like that, yeah, the second part is harder. How do you enforce it nationally or internationally? I mean, ideally, it can only be enforced internationally, given that these technologies are cross-border, transnational. But yes, I, I do believe that a, a, a bill of digital rights is essential. Uh, and it would have to have as its main pillars uh, private ownership of one's identity. I alluded to this earlier. Uh, we cannot allow banks and big tech companies to own our identity. What I would like us to do is to imagine of a bill of rights that would allow you uh, when you want to go somewhere, instead of you know, selecting some app belonging or created by some conglomerate like Uber or Lyft or whatever. Imagine if you were to go to a corner, um, to a street corner, and you were, the only thing you did was to say into your, into your machine, into your cell phone, uh, my name is Mark, I'm at the corner of such and such street, or here, where, here it is where, where my GPS tells me I am, and I'm going to the airport. That's it. And imagine if you had a flood of bids or suggestions or offers from different providers saying, you know, we, we will take you to the airport in five minutes and this is the price. Or even if, you know, the municipality transit system said, don't be stupid, there is a, you know, a bus <laughs> leaving <laughs> from, you know, 50 yards away. Um, it's cheaper and, 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 and better for the environment. Go and catch that one. But for you to be able to do this, you have to have the right to own your digital identity and to be able to broadcast it through the internet. So technologically, it's absolutely possible to, to do it. So a bill of digital rights would include self-ownership of one's identity, data that belongs to you, genuinely belongs to you, because now it doesn't belong to you, right? Uh, but that would come with a responsibility. It would come with the responsibility not to have free services, with the responsibility that when you buy services, when you use apps, you make micro payments. Uh, but if we have a basic income, a universal basic income, we could tie up the universal basic income with micro payments. We can call them a penny for your thought. This is an idea, um, uh, whereby you're actually contributing to the work other people do in order to provide you with digital services uh, without having to bombard you with uh, advertisements that they can only do today because you are not the owner of your identity, you're not the owner of your data. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you so much. For... Well, thank you, Stephanie. It's good to see you. Good luck with the rest of chapter three and we'll all look forward yes. to the whole book. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. You know that lady that is there in the, in the second row, in the black backpack. Uh, no, she's the lady I interviewed and told me she could be a candidate. Oh, what was her name? The lady, the black woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got you. Yes, in that. Yep, yep. Just tell me that. Thank you. All right. That's a lot. Yes, gotcha. Yes. I'll touch base.